is Senior Recognition Sunday, where we're going to be honoring several of our graduates. But guess what, Judy? What? I have a son named Stephen. He's graduating. Really? Yeah. I have a son named Stephen, too. No way. I do. Yeah. Oh, and mine is a transfer student this year going to Virginia Tech. No way. Yes. My son's going to Virginia no. Tech. No. Yeah. Two Stevens. Oh, look at your shirt. I like your shirt. I have a shirt, too. Yeah. Great. Two Stevens at Virginia Tech. Can't beat that. That's right.
good morning. This, we're going to start off this morning by praying for a, a special group of people. And I call them a special group of people because it, 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 it is a special group. Uh, over the last two years, uh, many of our uh, young uh, people have gone through high school in front of a computer. And to this, uh, this spring, they're going to be graduating. And I just would like to uh, spend a special time praying for them. We also uh, will pray for a number of other people who are going through some sicknesses or some surgery this week. So uh, will you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Gracious Father, it's that time of year, it's that springtime where it seems like everything's opening up and there's budding and there's excitement. And one of those exciting times is certainly graduation time. Lord, I, I thank you for the, the young people who are going to be graduating from this church uh, this spring. But I also ask that you be with the larger group, not only the ones in Fauquier County, but also in Culpeper and also in Prince William, Lord, that all um, are going to be graduating at this time. Lord, I, I, I pray that you will keep them safe, that you will encourage them, that you will uh, see that uh, you give them a bright future if we would just depend on you. Lord, we also pray for Regina. We ask that you be with her and with Carolyn as she goes through her surgery next week. We ask that you be with Christy as she recovers. Be with Susie as she recovers. Um, comfort Jan and her family as they uh, deal with the loss of a son. And Lord, we pray for our, our sister Sharon. And we ask that you be with her as she uh, deals with uh, issues with her, uh, her kidneys. And Lord, um, we also let us not forget about Mark. And we ask that you be with him as he, uh, again, tries to recover from uh, this high blood pressure and this, uh, this seizure that it seems like he has had. Lord, be with them. Lord, help us to think about them during the week. Help us to be mindful of ways that we can reach out and help our brothers and sisters who are going through some difficult times. Lord, uh, we hold this day up to you, uh, and uh, we pray all these things in your Son's holy and gracious name, that of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have your Bibles, grab them. We're going to continue in our study of the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to be looking at a very... Uh, narrow portion of Acts. It's Acts 2, 14 and uh, 21, and we're going to get into that uh, in, in depth today as we look at this whole concept of a new day when the Holy Spirit comes down upon the church. And not only is it going to be the, a new day, it's going to be talk about the last days, which has always been of interest to people. When I was in college, uh, a uh, bunch of college friends and I used to go out hiking. We used to enjoy being out in the outdoors. And uh, during spring break, we would always find different places to go. We weren't the kind that went down to Daytona. We ended up going into the mountains of North Carolina or we go down to the beaches of Texas. But there was this one trip that we took. I remember it was a uh, four or five day hike and it was in the Nantahala Mountains of North Carolina. And on the last day of the trip, well, actually before the last day, the, 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 the night before the last day, we decided that we were going to uh, pitch tent uh, just about 100 yards from the top of this mountain so that the next morning we could get up and we could go to the top and experience sunrise on the top of this mountain. And so uh, that's exactly what we did. We pitched tents and... Uh, the next morning, we got up real early, and uh, we got all the way up to the top of this mountain. And it, you, you were almost anticipating what was going to happen. Um, you, you, you could feel the sun coming up, and you could, uh, the birds were chirping. And, but you weren't at the top of the hill yet, so you were anticipating what was going on. And then we get to the top of the hill, sunrise just about at the right time and there in front of us was this gigantic valley with the sun coming up and the birds chirping and 
the, the, uh, the beautiful scenery, it was just glorious. It seemed like in this new day that we were experiencing, life was good, and it was a new day. This morning, we are celebrating our graduates here at Bilton Baptist Church. And uh, I think of graduation as that time like it's a new day. Uh, what a great opportunity for people. What an incredible time to look forward to. Uh, I love when they say that the world is your oyster. I really do believe that when you graduate high school and you start going out into the world, the world is truly your oyster. It's a new day. It's a new day for our graduates. It's a new day for their parents. It's a new day for people who are looking forward into things. And in many ways, the verses that we are looking at this morning remind me of the same thing. It reminds me that the church is experiencing a new day. We are in Acts, uh, the second chapter, verses 14 and 21. We are just coming off of a very extraordinary event. Peter and the disciples were together on that, uh, that morning. Uh, it was Pentecost. And as they were uh, together, there was this whoosh of wind, a mighty rushing wind. And then something that looked like the tongues, uh, like tongues of fire uh, came down upon them. And the disciples started speaking in the native language of people who were visiting Jerusalem at Pentecost. And the, this entire spectacle, it attracted the attention of the people passing by. We uh, were saying last week, we're not sure if they were in kind of a, uh, uh, a courtyard, um, or they might have been in one of the uh, uh, rooms at the, uh, the temple. They were meeting there, and the people heard them speaking, and they were all hearing it in their own native tongues. And uh, they came... And many of them were interested on what was going on, but some weren't. And they were thinking that these people were crazy. Uh, we experience that, don't we? we uh, sometimes people uh, are really interested in hearing what uh, we have to say. Other times they think that we're crazy. Anyway, in verse 14, uh, it, it, it recounts the end of this, uh, this uh, situation. And Peter is speaking. So let's start off with verse 14. But Peter stood up with the eleven, the other, uh, other apostles, raised his voice and proclaimed to them, men of Judah and all you residents of Jerusalem. He's speaking to everybody that is in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk. Uh, Skeptics were saying that perhaps they were drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And I will even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days. And they will, be, they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In researching this, I was looking through a number of commentators, and the commentators uh, pointed out that in the New Testament, there are several different kinds of preaching that we see practiced in the early church. The first was proclamation, meaning that it was just stating the facts of the Christian message. The second was actually a method called teaching, where 
uh, there was explanation and interpretation of the facts and a little bit of what the so what was and explaining that. The third type of uh, preaching that was done in the New Testament was exhortation to apply the message to somebody's life and encourage them to live out that life. The fourth method of preaching was the treatment of a subject or area of life in, in a view of the Christian message. How do I live in regards to what Jesus told us? That was another method. Fifth, there was the sharing of a word from God, be it in new revelation or old, meaning it was prophecy. There was, it, it was prophetic. And sometimes the messages were primarily prophetic. And then finally, the apologetic or the apologia, uh, a defense of the Christian message in the face of hostile adversaries or uh, a hostile attack. Often when the uh, early church would speak, they would combine two or more of these kinds of uh, preachings into one message as Peter did in the, the, the sermon that we have in the Acts uh, the second chapter. Here we find Peter beginning with the defense, and that's primarily what we're going to focus on this morning. And then later on, he uh, transitions into a proclamation, and finally an exhortation for the crowd that had gathered. Now, there's a lot of people that will argue that there's only certain ways of uh, of uh, preaching a message, but the reality is, is that in the early church there were many different ways. Uh, some people favor an expository message, and that's fine, it's a good message. And others favor a topical. Now, topical is good, but I will say it's more challenging than expository because topical is easy to get off track and say something that may not be as biblical as it would be expository. But there's many different ways, and we need to be aware of those in fact, that's why I pre preach in a number of different ways, because that's what they did in the uh, first century church. And in fact, if you go back into the Gospels, that's the way Jesus preached. Um, the early church varied their message. Now, Paul, Peter uh, is beginning a defense here. And in this defense, Peter starts off with an appeal to logic. Now, I will tell you that some people feel uncomfortable with using logic when they're trying to explain uh, Scripture. Uh, there is nothing wrong with appealing to logic. After all, Christianity, in my mind, is a thinking man's religion. It allows you to think through things, and logic is often used. Let me just give you a couple of examples. First, I want to take you back to after the Last Supper. You know, there was a lot of bravado at that Last Supper that they would never forsake Jesus. But as we saw in the garden, and then later on, uh, uh, during the following day, all his uh, disciples forsook him. And some, some were so scared that they ran away without any clothes on. That's uh, one of the uh, explanations we have in the Gospel. But then, all of a sudden, some, something changes because they're back here in Acts. They're back in Jerusalem. And now they're preaching the gospel. And logic tells me that something had to happen between the, the scared people after the Last Supper and what we're seeing now. Something special had to happen. And of course, what we know is that Jesus was resurrected and these disciples saw him for a period of about 40 days. Second, if you go into 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks of all the people that Jesus appeared to after his crucifixion. There were the uh, uh, disciples, they were called the 12, there was really only 11 at the time. Uh, there was the, the 500 and uh, people that uh, saw um, Jesus, we believe we saw, he, they, they saw him up in Galilee. There was his brother, James, who wasn't even part of the action prior to Jesus' uh, uh, resurrection. But James became in fine. And then finally, 1 Corinthians 15 says that finally, Paul. 
and that Paul, he appears to Paul. And you have to use logic on this and say, all these people just made it up? All these people just kind of contrived this idea? Uh, no, that's not logical. It's not logical. It was just uh, less than 30 years after uh, Jesus' resurrection, and there were still people in Jerusalem who knew all about these things, so they could, could just check. Uh, logic helps us sometimes when we look at Scripture. But then Peter also refers to Bible prophecy. He, he refers to a, 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 a book in uh, the minor prophets in the Old Testament. It was the book of Joel. And he refers to this prophet Joel who lived in the rebuilt city of Jerusalem. Remember that uh, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Bab Babylonians and they lived in Babylonia for uh, Babylon for 70 years and then they returned. And um, it was about 400 years before Jesus' birth that we see that happening. And in this scripture, Peter paints a picture of what becomes a really new day. Uh, 400 years, it's a long time coming. People have been expecting something like this. And after 400 years, Peter paints that picture of that uh, prophecy that was spoken about in Joel. It's a new day in the church. The church is planted on this day. It's a new covenant. It speaks of the new covenant that we have between Jesus Christ and, uh, and his people. It's almost like you're standing awaiting to go into a wedding and all of a sudden the ballroom is uh, thrown open and it, it, it is exciting to see what's going on in there. Peter says, on the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, meaning that they will speak prophetically. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days. And by saying those things, what uh, Peter is saying is that it, th this message is for all of humanity. It is for everyone. And they will prophesy, and that's how it ends. To this international audience in Jerusalem, Peter lays out God's plan for the new covenant, for this, this, uh, this time that comes after Jesus' departure and ascension into heaven. In the Old Testament, uh, if, uh, just as a reminder, the Holy Spirit was present in the Old Testament, but what he, when the Holy Spirit would come, he would come and rest on specific people for specific reasons. And he would rest on them. They were all always Jews. And then uh, uh, after they, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, purpose was uh, realized, the Holy Spirit would then return to the Father. Now what Peter is saying is the Holy Spirit is here to stay. And not just for the Jews. You have to remember the Jews were God's uh, chosen people. And uh, they were the ones that received the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. But it wasn't only for the Jews now in the New Testament, in this New Testament time. It was for all people. The Jews, the Greeks, the rich, the poor. It was for all. And then Peter brackets this time period. This time period of evangelistic opportunity is not going to last forever. It's going to be a new day. And there's going to be excitement and God is going to do some wonderful things during this period. But there's going to be a last day. And so uh, Peter brackets this time. The last days uh, are, are those days 
that are defined as the period after Jesus' resurrection. Do you know that Jesus is the final word? He's the final word. He's, he, uh, he comes, he explains uh, how we can uh, receive eternal life, eternal life with him. And there's not going to be someone else coming after him giving us more explanation on how we do that. He is the final word. The final word. He is going to tell us, and he has told us, how we can have eternal life. That we begin on a road that is to eternal death. With his coming, he shows us the road to eternal life. And that road leads directly through the cross. And all we need to do is believe in what Jesus did, that he took our sins and took it upon himself. He took our place in death so that we could have life. And all we need to do to receive Jesus Christ is to um, believe in him and live according to his ways as best we can. This is not going to change. There's not going to be another. Jesus is the final word. Peter repeats the, that Joel when he speaks of the, excuse me, Peter repeats Joel when he speaks of this closing bracket. He says in verse 19, I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. Peter is bracketing things. There are some I know that believe, some commentators believe, that uh, when Peter speaks this, he's speaking specifically to the, the day of Pentecost. Well, there are some things that didn't happen on Pentecost. There was no uh, 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 blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. That was something that Peter was speaking about that's going to come at the end, at the end of these final days, these final days that we live. And it is in those final days that we live. We are bracketed by these two great truths. The first is that we have a new day. It's a new day, and we no longer have to give sacrifices, animal sacrifices, at the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem. We don't have to do that. We just have to commit and devote ourselves to uh, Jesus and follow him. But it's also the final day. It's the new day, but it also speaks of the final days, meaning we have to keep in mind that one day it's all going to end that the day of the Lord is going to come, and it's going to be a remarkable day. It's going to catch many people by surprise, uh, but for the Christian, it will be a glorious day. I want to speak to that group that we talked about in our prayer this morning, this, this, uh, these graduates. I want to encourage you. The world is open to you. The world is is just the place that you get to live in. And it, and it is an exciting place. It is a place that has been built and uh, designed by God. There are glorious things that we can experience. And I hope that uh, as a graduate, the veil that has always been around, like I'm living with mom and dad and everything, that, it's, that veil is torn back. And you get to see the miles and miles of opportunity that are set before you. I encourage you that as you look to this new day after graduation, to seize it, to seize the day, because the opportunities are immense, and you will be amazed. But at the same time, don't forget, this planet we live on has a ticker on it. It is only going to last for so long. And we have tickers on it. Because the Bible says that uh, we, we all are going to die. You know?
know, one certainty when we're born into this earth is that we're going to die. So take those two things into account as you step out into your new life beyond graduation. Experience and rejoice in the new day. It is a great time, a great place to be. But also remember that there's a day coming when it's all going to end. And if you keep your mind and you keep your vision on that and organize and orchestrate your life according to that principle, life is going to be very exciting and very good. Let's pray. Heavenly Gracious Father, I just thank you for the graduates. I thank you for the people here this morning. I ask that you be with them. Lord, that they may see the opportunity that we have in Christ. The things that he lays before us. The opportunities we have to share with our neighbors and our friends. We do not have to be fearful because God and Jesus Christ has conquered fear. We get to look with anticipation for the future. Excited for what God has already created and what he will create when this world ends. Thank you for everything you do, Lord. Be with us this day. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Hey mates, welcome to Zoomerang. As we zoom around Australia, we'll discover some amazing animals and sights. More importantly, like a boomerang, we are returning kids to what the Bible says about the value of life. We'll discover how precious each and every one of us is to God, from the tiniest to the oldest. Each person is made in the image of God, wonderfully designed to know Him and to live for Him. Out of His great love, God offers us salvation through His Son, Jesus. Kids will learn that life is valuable. Grab your sunnies, that's your sunglasses and your mates, those are your friends, and get ready for a fair dinkum time at Zoomerang.